Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I'm Meher Sher and these are the headlines. The U.S. mediation talks between Azerbaijan and Armenia have failed to halt the ongoing fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh. In Washington, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo urged the foreign ministers of the countries to implement a ceasefire. In a tweet, Pompeo urged both sides to return to substantive negotiations under the auspices of the Minsk Group. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari says 51 civilians and 18 security forces have been killed in unrest in the country. In a statement, President Buhari blamed protesters for the violence. He said security forces used extreme restraint as the peaceful protests have been hijacked by thugs and rioters. The U.S. has sanctioned a Russian government research institute for allegedly using Triton virus in 2017 cyber attacks. The U.S. Treasury Department said the institution is involved in attacking a petrochemical facility in the Middle East. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin alleged Moscow is behind the activities that threaten security of the U.S. and its allies. The number of global COVID-19 infections has topped 42 million with more than 1.14 million deaths. India's infections have crossed 7.8 million with over 53,000 new cases and 650 deaths overnight. Brazil has recorded 571 coronavirus deaths in the past 24 hours, taking the toll to over 156,000. In Pakistan, 12 more people have lost their lives to the virus, bringing the fatality count to 6,727. Well, those were the headlines. More news in detail after a short break. Welcome back. The U.S. mediation talks between Azerbaijan and Armenia have failed to halt the ongoing fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said Secretary Mike Pompeo has urged Baku and Yerevan to implement a ceasefire. In a tweet, Pompeo asked both sides to return to substantive negotiations under the auspices of the Minsk Group. He said conflict should be resolved on the principles of non-use of force, territorial integrity, and self-determination of the people. Pompeo met separately with the foreign ministers of the two sides in an attempt to end the fighting. Over 750 people have been killed as the clashes are still ongoing in several parts of Nagorno-Karabakh. Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari says 51 civilians and 18 security forces have been killed in unrest in the country. In a statement, President Buhari blamed protesters for the violence. He said security forces used extreme restraint as the peaceful protests have been hijacked by thugs and rioters. Buhari said another 37 civilians have been injured as the mayhem has not stopped yet. The president warned protesters against undermining national security and law and order. The protests turned violent on Wednesday after the military's shooting a day earlier. Mobs vandalized and burned police stations, courthouses, while police fired tear gas to disperse them. Moving on, U.S. President Donald Trump says Sudan and Israel have agreed to make peace and normalize their relations. In a joint statement, the U.S., Sudan and Israel said the agreement ends hostilities between Khartoum and Tel Aviv. More in the following report. with Israel, the latest in a series of Arab League countries to do so. Development followed U.S. President Donald Trump's step to remove Sudan from a list of countries sponsoring terrorism. At the White House, President Trump said at least five additional countries want to join in a peace deal with Israel. The State of Israel and the Republic of Sudan have agreed to make peace. This is for many, many years they've been uh, at odds, to put it nicely. 
and to normalize their relations. Uh, this will be the third country where we're doing this, and we have many, many more coming. Healing the move, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said this is the start of a new era in the region. He said the Israeli and Sudanese delegations will meet soon to discuss commercial and agricultural cooperation. As Sudan's acting foreign minister said the deal for normalizing ties with Israel depends on approval from its yet-to-be-formed legislative council. Palestinians condemned the agreement, terming Sudan's decision as a new stab in the back. This announcement harms our people and our fair case, and it encourages the occupation to commit more crimes and to deny our rights. It also harms the national benefits of Sudan and will harm the Arab interests in the region. This announcement serves the Zionist occupation and its expanding policy in the region. For sure, it only serves Trump's election publicity and Netanyahu in his internal conflict. Sudan is the third Arab country to set aside hostilities with Israel in the past two months after the UAE and Bahrain. Israel says it will not oppose U.S. sales of specific weapon systems to the UAE, referring to the American F-35 fighters. This was said in a joint statement by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Benny Gantz. The Israeli leaders stressed that the new misunderstandings are not part of the recent peace agreement it signed with Abu Dhabi. Washington agreed to consider allowing the UAE to buy F-35 jets in a side deal to a normalization agreement with Israel. On Thursday, Gantz signed a defense agreement with his U.S. counterpart, Mark Esper. The pact confirms Washington's commitment to maintaining its allies' qualitative military edge in the Middle East. Moving on, U.S. President Donald Trump is set to vote in Florida before campaigning next in three swing states. Trump will join over 53.5 million Americans who have cast record early ballots ahead of November 3rd election. U.S. President Donald Trump and rival Joe Biden have begun a sprint through the final 11 days until Election Day. U.S. Elections Project says the November 3rd polls can witness highest voter turnout in over a century. The surge in early voting is a sign of intense interest in the contest. Several states have expanded in-person early voting and mail-in ballots as a safer way to vote amid coronavirus pandemic. Meanwhile, Democratic nominee Joe Biden is heading to the battleground state of Pennsylvania for two events. Former President Barack Obama will campaign in Florida on behalf of his former vice president. Although Biden leads Trump nationally, opinion polls show a much closer race in crucial battleground states that will decide the election. Trump will hold rallies in North Carolina, Ohio and Wisconsin after casting his ballot. The U.S. has strongly criticized Turkey's test of Russian S-400 ballistic missile defense system. In a statement, Pentagon spokesman Jonathan Hoffman said the test can harm the Ankara-Washington security relations. Hoffman said an operational S-400 system is not consistent with Turkey's commitments as a U.S. and NATO ally. Earlier, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan confirmed that Ankara has conducted the test of S-400 on October 16th. He said Turkey doesn't need to take permission from the U.S. on this matter. U.S. President Donald Trump's administration has been trying to pressurize Ankara to cancel the S-400 purchase. Now, the U.S. has sanctioned a Russian government research institute for allegedly using Triton virus in 2017 cyber attacks. The U.S. Treasury Department said the institution is involved in attacking a petrochemical facility in the Middle East. It said Central Scientific Research Institute of Chemistry and Mechanics built the customized tools that enabled the attack. It said Triton targeted industrial control system used in critical facilities to initiate immediate shutdown procedures in emergencies. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin alleged that Moscow is behind the activities threatening the security of the United States and its allies. He said the U.S. will continue to defend its critical infrastructure from anyone attempting to disrupt it. Meanwhile, the Russian ambassador to the U.S. called the sanctions illegitimate. He said that Russia does not conduct offensive operations in the cyber domain. We'll return with more news after a short break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The number of global COVID-19 infections has topped 42 million with more than 1.14 million deaths. India's infections have crossed 7.8 million with over 53,000 new cases and 650 deaths overnight. Brazil has recorded 571 coronavirus deaths in the past 24 hours, taking the toll to over 156,000. More in the following report. The coronavirus continues to wreak havoc as it rages virtually throughout the world. Northern Hemisphere remains a region with major devastation as virus shows no sign of abating. The U.S. has recorded over 77,200 cases in the last 24 hours, marking its second highest number of single-day infections. After Argentina, Peru, Mexico and Colombia are set to hit 1 million infection mark. The World Health Organization has once again urged the world to take immediate action against rising surge in COVID-19 cases. We are at a critical juncture in this pandemic, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. The next few months are going to be very tough and some countries are on a dangerous track. Europe's infections have more than doubled in just 10 days with several nations reporting their highest daily cases. Tens of millions of people across the region face tougher restrictions as the battle rising infections. Spain's Prime Minister warned that actual COVID-19 cases in the country may have exceeded 3 million. Meanwhile, President Emmanuel Macron said France will have to live with the virus at least until next summer. Elsewhere, North Korea has urged its citizens to stay indoors amid warnings that dust blowing in from China can spread COVID-19. The coronavirus has claimed 12 more lives in Pakistan overnight, raising the death toll to 6,727. The health ministry says 847 people tested positive for the disease in the past 24 hours. The ministry said there are over 9,000 active COVID-19 cases in the country. It said out of over 327,000 countrywide cases, more than 310,000 have recovered so far. The ministry said over 143,000 cases have been detected in the Sindh province, while Punjab has reported over 102,000 cases. In the capital city of Islamabad, over 18,000 have been infected so far. Moving on, in Pakistan, security forces have killed at least four terrorists during a raid in the Mastoom district of Balochistan. In a statement, the counterterrorism department said a large cache of arms and ammunition were recovered. It said two CTD personnel were wounded during an exchange of fire. Both were shifted to the hospital for medical treatment. Malaysia's King Al Sultan Abdullah will consult political leaders today to discuss proposals by Prime Minister Mohyuddin Yassin. In a statement, Presidential Palace said the Premier had asked the King to declare a state of emergency in the country. It said King Abdullah understands the need for leadership amid resurgence of coronavirus cases. Meanwhile, opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim denounced the proposals presented by Mohyuddin. He said Mohyuddin is trying to avoid showdown in Parliament House by presenting emergency proposal. Council of Rulers, comprised of Malaysia's nine royal houses, has the power to withhold law and question national policy. And in Guinea, gunfire rang out across the capital, Conakry, after preliminary results showed President Alpha Conde winning the re-election. Election Commission said Conde won twice as many votes as his opposition candidate, Celo Dalian Diallo. The president's decision to run for a third term has sparked repeated protests over the past year, resulting in dozens of deaths. But Conde says a March referendum has reset his two-term limit. The National Front for the Defense of the Constitution has called for nationwide demonstrations starting Monday. In Bolivia, the final vote count has confirmed a smashing win for socialist Luis Arce in the presidential election. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal said Arce won 55% of the votes against six rivals on the ballot. The runner-up was centrist former president Carlos Mesa with just under 29% votes. Conservative Luis Fernando Camacho received only 14% of the votes. This marks a vindication for the movement toward socialism party of ousted President Evo Morales. Arce's party also won majorities in both houses of Congress. On Monday, the party claimed victory as Mesa conceded the loss. 
And in Chile, clashes between police and anti-government protesters have erupted in the streets of the capital, Santiago. The latest unrest started just days before a referendum to decide on a new constitution. Bride police used tear gas and a water cannon to disperse the crowd. The demonstrators have been demanding a new constitution while protesting in the streets. In the upcoming referendum, voters will choose whether to reject or accept the drafting of a new constitution. Interior Minister Victor Perez said the plebiscite is a way for Chileans to resolve their differences. Opposition argues it is unnecessary to change a document that has made Chile one of the most stable economies in the region. Moving on to Cambodia, the death toll from flooding and landslides caused by heavy rains has risen to 39. The National Committee for Disaster Management said 38 people are still missing. It said around 483,000 people have been impacted by the floods and landslides. Heavy rains and floods also ravaged neighboring Vietnam, where at least 84 people have been killed in the past week. In the U.S., Colorado has seen three of its largest wildfires in state history to occur this year, two of which are still growing. An explosive wildfire has forced evacuations of several mountain communities in the state. The blaze has caused the closure of Rocky Mountain National Park as it burned another 45,000 acres. This comes in addition to more than one million acres of wilderness in Colorado, which has been deemed off-limits to the public. Officials say the East Troublesome Fire has now burned 170,000 acres and was only about 5% contained. The National Weather Service has forecasted continued hot, dry and windy conditions in much of Colorado. Now the peak pollution season has arrived in India with air quality levels dipping and monuments shrouded in smog. More in the following report. A thick blanket of smog covered large swaths of northern India as air quality index was recorded at very poor level, bordering to severe levels. The Indian capital of New Delhi continued its run with the dangerous air levels with monuments and buildings covered in thick smog. The situation was not very different in New Delhi's satellite city of Gurugram. There is smog everywhere I look. There is no sign of sunlight. The pollution is rising. Agra city, home to the iconic Mughal-era Taj Mahal monument, recorded air quality as poor. The shining white marble mausoleum, which can be spotted from kilometers away in normal weather, was only visible as a blurred silhouette on a hazy Friday morning. Those who have asthma problem or other respiratory issues, this pollution is highly problematic for them. It presents breathing problems to them. This has raised concerns whether pollution leads to more severe complications among patients infected by the novel coronavirus. Now, snooker is a hard enough game as it is, and it takes time to settle into the rhythm to play intricate shots. But Pakistan's Mohammed Ikram has taken it to a whole new level as he mastered to play the game using only his mouth. He flexes the muscles around his mouth and pushes the cue ball with his lower lip, making a shot straight into the corner pocket. More in the following report. Mohammed Ikram was born without arms, but that did not stop him from excelling. The 32-year-old is now well known among the local snooker community for being able to play the game by using only his mouth. His opponents apply chalk to their cue sticks as Ikram lines up his mouth just behind the cue ball for another shot. He would come to the club and ask that he be allowed to play. We would look at his arms and feel that he was unable to play, although he said he would play with his face. He insisted that we allow him to play a few games and prove himself. When he did that, we saw that he was actually very good, so we allowed him to play. He wins from the players as well as loses. Sometimes he's really very good. From an early age, Ikram watched other children in his home city of Samundri playing snooker and developed a liking for the game. He eventually began practicing in secret, hitting a cue ball with his mouth on an empty table. God has not given me arms, but he has given me courage, and I have used that spirit to fulfill my ambition, so no one should lose hope. Everyone should keep struggling to attain their goals. Practice paid off, and Akram has gained respect of snooker players in Samundri. 
Ikram's parents say they are brimming with pride and are extremely happy for his success. An immersive theatre show of The Great Gatsby has returned in London after COVID-19 induced break. The accessory of 2020, the face mask, was combined with 1920s themed fineries by guests who observe social distancing. More in the following report. Built by organizers as the first press night of the West End autumn season since the start of the pandemic, strict COVID-19 measures were in place as the Mayfair townhouse hosted London's The Great Gatsby Show. This is the hardest thing we've ever done. Um, but if you sit and listen to those audience members uh, cheer our performers on and you see the cast members just do their job really, really well, um, it's honestly one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. So I would say try, <laughs> I'd say fight for it. And there are people out there who need this in their lives, you know. The show is set in the fantasy world of F. Scott Fitzgerald's lead character, Jay Gatsby, with people invited to attend one of his infamously opulent parties. In normal times, Gatsby is staged as an immersive experience and audience participation is a key feature. Where audiences or guests would normally dance, sip champagne, mingle with actors and get invited to visit other rooms in the Gatsby mansion. The production has now been reimagined and reset as an art deco masquerade ball. We've had to make some fundamental changes to the show. So there are some scenes that we used to have. For instance, we used to have a 250-person Charleston. Now, it was really gorgeous to watch, but it's probably not the most responsible thing to do. So we've turned that into uh, uh, a new scene. So a lot of the key creatives, the original creatives for the production, came back to the rehearsal room, which, again, is a very rare thing. By audience, London's theatre scene is slightly bigger than the Broadway in New York. Theatres in London saw revenue of nearly £800 million last year, with the average ticket costing around £50. As the curtain fell, audiences leaving the venue were both in high spirits and nostalgic. Moving on to football, Leeds United outplay Aston Villa by 3-0 in the Premier League. Patrick Bamford scored a second-half hat-trick to secure a win for Leeds United. Leeds secured a lead in 55th minute when Bamford pounced Emiliano Martinez's pushed-out shot to slot home the loose ball. Twelve minutes later, Bamford capitalized on the lead, making it 2-0 with a fine shot from the edge of the area. The lead striker then completed the hat-trick curling finish after 74 minutes for his first Premier League treble. With this victory, Leeds United move up to third place with 10 points and two points behind Aston Villa. And Pakistan's upcoming three-match T20 series against Zimbabwe has been shifted to Rawalpindi from Lahore. In a statement, the Pakistan Cricket Board said the matches have been moved due to poor air quality in Lahore. PCB Chief Ex Executive Wasim Khan said the air pollution in the city posed a health risk to keep the matches in Lahore. Earlier this month, the PCB shifted the three-match ODI series against Zimbabwe from Multan to Rawalpindi. The first match of the series begins on the 30th of October in Rawalpindi. Now it's time to take a look at the latest weather updates from around the world. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.